when the Ethel and Julius Rosenbergs were both convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage and subsequently executed in 1953, they were often viewed as a single entity, a couple. But in a new book, Ethel Rosenberg, An American Tragedy, we meet her as her own person, a daughter, a mother, a wife, an activist, and a woman infused with curiosity, anxiety, and a stalwart capacity for loyalty, albeit complicated and conflicting loyalties. This story is in the experienced hands of Anne Seba, whose previously critically acclaimed books about Jenny Churchill, Wallace Simpson, and Mother Teresa portray strong women in their own light and distinct from their typical tropes and confines. Anne is a British journalist, lecturer, historian, documentarian, holding prestigious positions at English Penn, National Archives Trust, and the Institute of Historical Research. I am delighted to welcome Anne to Just the Right Book to explore the story that continues to fascinate us almost 70 years later. Anne, welcome. Thank you so much. And why does this story fascinate us 70 years later? Well, there are so many reasons I could give you. I think for me, Julius is really quite straightforward in a way. Mm. He was um, so keen. He's almost like a puppy dog offering his services to the Soviets. They were both communists. But I think the reason that Ethel has been portrayed in so many works of literature is because she's the more fascinating one. Her role was really complex. And as you said in your introduction, she really defies labeling. People have tried to portray her as victim or martyr or mother or whatever, but she's all of those things. And how on earth did she come to her final decision? People assume that she chose death. I don't believe she chose death. I think she was trapped, but perhaps we'll come on to that later on. I don't really want to um, preempt the end of her life before we talk about the beginning, but she really defies labeling and that's why she's interesting. So let's start with the beginning, because I do think that um, her life story in many ways predicted a direction that she might have gone in and even the betrayals that happened later. So share with us her origins from when she was born in 1915, I believe, right? Uh, absolutely. So she was born in 1915 the daughter of immigrant Jews on the Lower East Side, but her mother particularly was cold towards Ethel because she was also the mother of three sons. So the, the mother is called Tessie. And Tessie really believed that education was wasted on her daughter, that daughters should just get married and help their parents, but education for the sons was what mattered. And so Ethel grew up in a family where all the love was showered on, particularly her younger brother, David, who was seven years younger. And Ethel herself thought David was wonderful, but for Ethel, the chance to change came with her school. Ethel was a bright child. Ethel was probably the brightest of all the children. She skipped a year at school. Not only was she clever, but she was musical. She was talented and she had a lovely voice. She was self-taught and at school she learned to act and sing, but she had to leave school at 15. She couldn't go to college. She had to take a secretarial course and worked in a packing company. But nonetheless, she shows her real determination at this stage in her life because she wants to join a choir. And for Ethel, it's not good enough to join any choir. She has to join the very best that Manhattan offers, the Schola Cantorum, and she auditions 
for this choir and she's turned down the first time but she doesn't take no for an answer she goes home and finds a piano because this is the depression so that's really an, an important aspect of her life and people are throwing out furniture like pianos and she buys one very cheaply and teaches herself to sight sing and goes back for a second audition and is taken on and she's the youngest to sing at Carnegie Hall with the Schola Cantorum. So I think what you're seeing here is this incredible single-mindedness. And the other key fact, I think, of Ethel's youth, because she is only 19, is that at this packing company, at the same time, she joins a strike. And her fellow workers at the time describe her as quite shy and timid. But during this strike, she becomes a leader and she lies down in the road to stop the trucks coming through. And although she's fired and loses her wages for six months, the newly formed Labour Relations Board decides that Ethel was unfairly fired and therefore deserves to have her wages given back to her in back pay afterwards. So when the strike is successful, I think Ethel realizes the power of activism at that point. So these two facts, I think, are, are very telling in terms of Ethel's personality, this single-minded determination that actually you can make a difference if you really decide to. And, and uh, you know, a lot, a, a lot of that was a bit of a surprise to me about her accomplishment. And we'll come to it a little bit later on. But when she quit her job, she was making an unusually large amount of money for a woman at that point. I mean, she was making something like $1,400 a year when when there were people making $2 or $5 a day uh, for work. And yet she gave that, uh, gave that up. But the other piece I'd like you to cover that was striking, which I think starts to play into uh, what goes on later with her family is the economics of the various um, families, her, her brother, David, her, in-law, the Rosenbergs, as, com as compared to her parents and her siblings, ha all of that seemed to make a difference in terms of their being attracted to communism and or nonetheless wanting to be upwardly mobile. Well, you've touched on a lot of interesting things, yes. So Ethel was a communist, and I think Ethel's communism had two prongs to it, like many others at the time. She probably joined the Communist Party in 1936. And basically her communism was like many others, idealism. She mm -hmm. wanted a better world. That's, that, that's a, a, a very normal aspect. But in 1936, it was sharpened by the fact that she wanted, she saw communism as the only way to defeat fascism because 1936 was a key year in the world. That's when Hitler marched into the Rhineland and nobody stopped him, even though he was overturning the, the Treaty of Versailles. It's when um, France had a popular front government, which didn't last very long, which included communists. But most of all, in Spain, it was when the nationalists and the republicans were in, engaged in a fierce civil war. So Ethel had many friends who went off to fight in Spain. So really as, as a way of attacking the fascists and the Nazis, communism seemed the answer. But, but you talk about the two families, the Rosenbergs and the Green Glasses. Ethel was born into the Green Glass family, this very dysfunctional, family and she met Julius in 36 and he too was a communist. He came to one of her 
singing event. She was singing for a fundraising gala. And they weren't married until 1939. And for Ethel, this really was a leap forward, as you say, because Julius was college educated. So he was an engineering student. I don't think he really loved engineering, but it was probably vocational. So Ethel really saw herself moving into a possibly higher social stratum. But here we have Ethel's mother again, who couldn't believe that Ethel was bothering her mind with Italian arias and Russian peasants. So she saw her own daughter as something of a snob because she felt that she should be concerned with matters closer to home, her, her own family. So I, I think from this point, her brother David, who really was not terribly clever and failed many of his exams, looked up to Ethel and Julius, but at the same time when he married Ruth, another clever girl who didn't go to college, a bit like Ethel, and, and you would think that Ethel and Ruth could really have been um, sisters in arms almost, and yet Ruth and David somehow were jealous of Ethel and Julius, whom they saw as somehow cleverer and doing better than, than they managed. So, you know, this is the family dynamics at, at work. And, and, so, Anne, the other thing that was interesting to think about, so Julius and Ethel Rosenberg remain the only Americans ever put to death in peacetime for conspiracy to commit espionage. And their conviction was defined by how we viewed communism at the moment of their trial. Yet, as you started to explain to us, in 1936, our relationship with Soviet Union, we, we had just recognized Soviet Union as a country you know, they they were our enemy for a minute. They were our allies in World War II. And then we were in the Cold War. How did that whole sort of seesaw of how we viewed communism end up making being a member of the Communist Party almost its own conspiracy? Oh, there's a lot of history in there. I'll, I'll try and tell it very briefly. You're absolutely right. To be a communist in 1939 was very uncomfortable. A lot of people left the Communist Party because of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And then in 1941, it became more comfortable once, um, uh, uh, once America and Russia were allies. And um, the, so the pact was broken because Hitler had marched into, into Russia. So at that point, suddenly America was persuading its citizens that actually you must understand the Soviet Union. As, as you said, they used to be our enemies, but now they're our brave allies. And Julius took it a stage further because he believed that anyone who was our ally should actually have access to any information or useful sources of information that could help them. It wasn't fair that they didn't share in, in all of this knowledge that, that America had. So um, during the war, uh, when there were many rallies and films trying to persuade Americans to understand the Soviet Union. And then immediately after 1945, and really the Yalta Conference, when um, the world was carved up, the whole thing changes again. And after Yalta, it's quite clear that Russia actually will have access to a large part of, of Europe. And that's when Germany is divided into East and West. And then in 1946, Winston Churchill makes his famous speech at Fulton, Missouri, talking about an iron curtain having descended. And in 1949, Russia explodes an atomic bomb. And that's really the key moment. And many people in America saw communism as one great monolith. Uh, the following year, China became 
communist as well. And then in 1950, there's the Korean War. So suddenly, um, the communists are viewed as the world enemy. And there's this tremendous fear and a genuine fear, an existential fear that we may have won, the West may have won the war, but we're in danger of losing the peace. And, and a real fear that American lives, American young men who had given their lives to fight in World War II, um, what was the point of it if suddenly America is going to lose the peace and if Russia has access to atomic power? There's a fear that um, children in, in, in New York are given these films, these duck and dive films, because there's a fear that the bomb might explode actually on American soil. And nobody could believe that Russia actually had access to making its own atomic bomb. Therefore, there's this search for spies, this real fear, which becomes hysteria and paranoia once Senator McCarthy uh, starts to say that there, there are communist spies everywhere, but he is right that although um, uh, Russia actually was able to manufacture atomic power, there were American spies who were helping them. And this all unravels in 1950 when an East German physicist called Klaus Fuchs is arrested in England, in Cambridge, and Klaus Fuchs, who had worked at the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, Klaus Fuchs is arrested. He immediately confesses, and it's very interesting to see how, how the Brits deal with him, because they want this to be very low-key. They don't want to draw attention to the fact that there was a spy in, in the midst of all this. So he's given 14 years, which is the maximum sentence for, um, a, as far as the, the, the British are concerned, for anyone involved in espionage. He serves only nine and a half. But Klaus Fuchs names names. He names his courier, who is Harry Gold. Harry Gold names a young couple in Albuquerque to whom he, um, with, with whom he, he transferred information. And they are David Greenglass and his wife, Ruth. David doesn't name names, but he names a name. He names Julius Rosenberg. And so Julius is arrested in the summer of 1950 and the authorities and the FBI assume he too will name names, but actually that's where it goes wrong for the authorities because Julius doesn't name any other names. So three weeks later, the authorities arrest Julius's wife, Ethel, and Ethel also does not name names. Now, they... Uh, the reason that they're able to arrest Julius is because of this secret information, which subsequently um, we know was the Venona decrypts. So the, the FBI know that Julius, who had a code name, was involved as a spying recruiter in passing information. They do not know about Ethel, but they assume that even though, as they admit, the evidence against Ethel was weak, at best or shaky, they assume as a woman, as a mother of two children, she's bound to name names, she'll want to get out of prison, but she doesn't. So they arrest Ethel really as a lever, that's not my word, that's theirs, that's the lever strategy. They think that if they arrest both Ethel and Julius for conspiracy to commit espionage, they are bound to spill out all these names. And they never do. And at the end, the Deputy Attorney General actually says, Ethel called our bluff. So you just covered a pile of things. <laughs> I want to unwrap um, a few of them. And one of the things that was um, a bit of a surprise to me, so Julius Rosenberg struck me 
Uh, you know, he had failed at business. He had had some jobs. He lost some jobs because of his communist affiliation. Um, he almost seemed um, less philosophical about communism. And I don't think this is really the right word, but there was almost like a, you use the word puppy dog. I, I use the word sort of like this haplessness about his enthusiasm. And I almost couldn't tell whether it was commitment to the theory or it was being part of something. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Julius loved some mirage. He couldn't possibly know what Russia was like, but he had some idea that this was the right sort of system, the right sort of country. And yes, he loved being part of it. He clearly had a very close relationship with his, well, not his first hander, his second hander, actually, a man called Alexander Fetlitsov. And he, he did not do it for money. The, there was no money involved in this. They had to fight to give him his expenses. And when he was in trouble, they tried to give him some emergency cash just in case he could get out. But I think there is an argument to be made that once he had children, um, he might have thought twice about exactly what he was doing, which is why his sons believe fervently that Ethel was not involved because once they had children, they would have needed to have um, a mother. There's, there's absolutely no proof that that was why she wasn't involved. I actually think her focus was on being a mother more than on being a, a good communist. But it's also why I wanted to focus on Ethel, because they are always seen as the Rosenbergs, those spies. And actually, I, I think Ethel had a, a different priorities at, at this point in, in her life. So what I want to do in in the time that we have is I want to break down the trial itself and its own travesties from the 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 complexity or inexplicableness of how Ethel went about making decisions to take the Fifth Amendment or not testify and her divided loyalty. So let's start with um, one simple thing. When Ethel was brought before the grand jury, at that time under U.S. law, she did not have a right to an attorney. Is that, do I have that right? You, you absolutely do. And uh, she, she was, you could say, very ill-advised. I would say about her lawyers, it's easy to criticize Manny Block, who in a way is a bit of a hero to me because I think he was heroically trying to do his best and was way out of his depth. But um, she didn't have a lawyer when, when she appeared before the grand jury. She appeared before the grand jury twice. Um, and believed in her rights as a U.S. citizen, that therefore, if she took the Fifth Amendment, because what was on trial was communism. There was, as we talked about earlier, this real existential fear that the communists were going to somehow uh, cause, I mean, it was not illegal to be a member of the Communist Party. What was illegal was if your loyalty was, was in question. So... Uh, Ethel and Julius believed that they could take the Fifth Amendment because if it couldn't be proved that they were communists, they believed, or at least Julius did, that nothing could be proved against them because they didn't know about this secret information that actually the, the government was it, it, it had these the, the Venona decrypt. So they knew that Julius was involved. And Ethel, of course, in these Venona cables, which became public in 1995, did not have a code name. She was not dealing directly with the KGB. So she was right in a way to be confident that there was no evidence against her. Well, and, and you know, you talk in the book a little bit about the fact that, and there's 
legal arguments all over this that taking the Fifth Amendment as a way not to incriminate yourself actually becomes the most incriminating thing yes. that you could do. And that certainly happened with Ethel. Absolutely. Um, and so the jury believed that she was shifty and that she couldn't be trusted. I mean, I don't think that's really what the trial came down to. If we're talking about the trial, um, the, it, it was full of miscarriages of justice. So it's not a crime to think. It's not a crime to know. And actually, Ethel was not even obliged to report spousal wrongdoing. The only um, actual crime is to take affirmative action, an overt act. So when um, the, the, the FBI and the government realized that they didn't actually have an overt action with which to convict Ethel, look, conspiracy is almost impossible to disprove. Of course, Ethel and Julius were involved in uh, uh, discussing things. Ethel knew what Julius was doing. I'm, I'm really make no bones about that. She not only knew, she probably approved. But where do you come up with an overt action? So uh, a few weeks, a few days before the trial, suddenly the prosecution lawyer, 23 year old um, Roy, Roy Cohn, <laughs> yes, he, he persuades Ethel's brother, David, in order to save his own skin and that of his wife, Ruth, who was never indicted, although it's known that they were involved in spying. So they do, do a plea bargain. And David invents this story that he has seen his sister, Ethel, do the typing. There's the overt action, which is perjury, because when he came out of prison um, less than 10 years later, he admitted that he hadn't actually seen his sister do the typing. It was probably, um, if anyone did the typing, he couldn't really remember, but if anyone did, it was his wife. And we now have access to his grand jury statements, which the defense at the time were not allowed access to. And he said very clearly when he was arrested, um, leave my sister out of it, not just because she's my sister, I promise you, my sister has nothing to do with it. So perjury was really the only way that Ethel was convicted. And, and the other miscarriage of justice is the way the judge, Irving Kaufman, constantly talked about treason. They were not being tried for treason. And the evidence that you require for treason is quite different. And particularly, you need two witnesses to an overt act. They didn't have that. But both the prosecution and the judge constantly referred to treason in, in their oral indictment. So I, I want to I wanna reinforce a couple of the items that you mentioned and then ask another piece to the question. So uh, the year after David Greenglass died uh, in 2014, that grand jury information where he then said Ethel had nothing to do with the work that he and Julius were doing, but that was not known until 2014. And in that, at the time of the trial, it wasn't required of the prosecutors to release that information to the defense. Is it, do I have both those things right? You, you absolutely do. In 1957, it was a requirement for grand jury statements to be released. So they, they just missed it. So, so the question that I had is, so Roy Cohn convinces David that the way in which he could save his wife, Ruth, would be by turning over Ethel. But what I'm, I'm curious about, and I know there's not a known answer, obviously, but in your research, do you think if David had merely testified against Julius, would Ruth still have been saved without Ethel being the pawn? Basically, she became a pawn. 
Yes, absolutely a porn or, or a lever. Oh, that I hate these what if questions because, you know, there are always so many variables. I actually find that particularly hard to answer because we're dealing with these Venona cables, this um, material that had to be kept secret. It had to be kept secret because the government was convinced that there was a nest of spies. In fact, some of them had already fled. And, and clearly Julius and Ethel did save at least two people by not naming names. But in Venona, um, where it says very clearly, apart from the fact that Ethel had no code name, Ethel does not work. And the two men who were responsible for the decryptions, Lamfer and Gardner, said very clearly in a memo, you might think this means she doesn't go out to work, but actually we mean she's not part of, uh, of the KGB network. So that was already known. So Ethel was used to try and make Julius talk and they were really treated as a unit. I think whatever David had said, um, Ethel had to be part of this because they had to apply pressure to Julius somehow to make him talk, to make him reveal names. So, you know, it's unknowable if they played a different game. But I think that the way they treated Ethel, it was part of <clears throat> this really firm belief that Ethel actually was the mastermind. Yeah. I mean, you see, you see that in uh, uh, President Eisenhower's refusal to grant clemency, this genuine belief that somehow Ethel was transgressive. I think for me, the misogyny is in some ways the most interesting part of all of this. The way Irving Kaufman in his summing up said she was a full-fledged partner in this crime, the way that because Ethel was two and three quarter years older, therefore she must be the one leading Julius astray. So I think there was a real genuine belief that somehow Ethel was so wicked for an American woman who at this point in 1950 ought to have been a housewife. You know, Ethel came to symbolize an attack on the American way of life post-war. I think the mere fact, as, as you're sort of pulling this out of me, what I believe, the mere fact that this perjured evidence concerned a typewriter is very revealing because a typewriter was something that many Americans would recognize. Perhaps their wives were secretaries. Perhaps the secretary in, in their business was someone they knew closely. You know, if you can't trust a woman you know who uses a typewriter, this is somehow upending the whole American way of life where women or wives in 1950 were expected to stay home and be dutiful wives. So Ethel had to be punished. I, I think that's actually a, a key part of this whole story. And I... I certainly came away with that as one of the two, and I'll bring up the second one in a minute, is if I found myself enraged, which I often did in reading uh, the book, I was enraged by reading some of the transcripts from the trial where I know I'm putting too fine a point on this statement, but they were almost convicting her as much for defying what they wanted a woman in 1950 uh, and 51 to be as her being a communist, where, I mean, you, you read these things from Irving Kaufman. I mean, the that he alone was infuriating to me, but how he obviously considered it a crime that she was of the intelligence and background and age. And it must have been that Julius just seemed like some weak sister. And therefore, Ethel had to be the one that was committed. She was that she was committing the crime. And part of her crime was being a, a strong woman. 
Yeah, this garbled Nietzschean philosophy that crept in that, you know, yeah. was the master and Julius was the slave. Whereas, uh, as I think you referred to very early on, when Ethel got a civil service job in Washington until Julius did, in fact, um, as soon as Julius did, she gave up her job and she became a good housewife. And that's what I was really trying to do in this book, to restore some humanity to Ethel, to show pictures that have never before been seen of Ethel as a loving mother, to show how concerned she was at, as a mother. That, that was very definitely um, a motivating factor for me too. But, but just back to the trial, it, it was a travesty. It, it was three and a half weeks of which three days were taken up with choosing the jury and some with, with the summing up. The actual time devoted to giving evidence about these deeply technical issues about atomic power and whether or not David, who'd flunked all his exams, could possibly have had the ability to recreate a lens mold is, is absurd. And anyway, had he done so, it had gone to um, it would have gone to, to the Soviet Union, so they couldn't produce the real thing. But much of it was like a stage performance with theatrical props. I mean, I've talked about the typewriter. The other aspect of, of the trial that I found so telling was the um, jello box. Because, you know, here's... <laughs> With, with a great flourish, the, the way Roy Cohn made um, the, the produced this uh, uh, alternate jello box because there couldn't have been the original one. And, and to cut it up, for, for those of you listening who don't know, the, the jello box was apparently cut in an asymmetrical way as a recognition signal. But the point underlying this you know, the, the subtle or not so subtle point was that here was Ethel again. A, a jello box was something that every American housewife would be familiar with, but Ethel was wicked because she had somehow uh, transgressed by using this wonderful aspect of, of an American housewife's kitchen as a recognition symbol for communists. So, you know, they, they took a lot more time to show how a jello box was cut up than they did to, to understand um, a, atomic power and, and how David could or could not have produced a, a drawing of a lens mold. You know, Anne, you mentioned that you, Manny Block, and, and then his father, Alexander, was the other attorney, became sort of a hero to you. You know, I didn't come away with that. I admired their commitment when nobody else was standing by Ethel. I mean, she was alone. Nobody was rehearsing her. Nobody was supporting her. I mean, it was, you described those scenes when she's in Sing Sing. I, I had tears in my eyes on every page. And, and to those listening, I, I thought those were such poignant, revealing pages about Ethel Rosenberg in all her complexity. But I thought, I, I thought Manny and Alexander were not up to the task. And where I, I felt they let Ethel down is they didn't bring somebody in who might be up to the task. Like they must have known they weren't up to the task, which I thought, not that that was fatal, but it, it didn't help that he was outmaneuvered by Roy Cohn and by Sarpo. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. They were outmaneuvered and they weren't up to the task, but I don't think anyone else was prepared to take it on. So yeah. they, they took it on. They worked as hard as they possibly could. I mean, I found it offensive the way Manny Block was treated in during the trial, but somehow, um, you know, he didn't let that affect him. He came back on the way they were constantly trying to look after the boys. I mean, they were fighting this on, on two fronts, on, on, on the one front. 
And Manny Block probably knew that Julius was involved in spying. So I think his, his task was particularly difficult. How on earth could he separate Ethel? And uh, the other front on which they were fighting was looking after the boys. So they had these multiple tasks and not nearly enough time. And when he complained that he hadn't been given enough time, Irving Kaufman slapped him down and said, you know, you should be very grateful for all the time I have given you. I think, I think the treatment of, of Manny Block when this was a case of life or death is utterly appalling and shaming. And the fact that the judge was colluding with the prosecution, I mean, that's, that's a gross miscarriage of justice as well. So at multiple levels, you know, this, this trial should have been thrown out as far as Ethel was concerned. And, and they did, you know, there we're, we're leaving out the efforts at a mistrial, the efforts at uh, an appeal, but here's the here's I think probably the crux of what becomes confusing or frustrating. Uh, you you talk in the book in many many parts of the book about her anxiety, her devotion, her approach to motherhood, and now here comes this defining moment. And um, she could have not taken the Fifth Amendment. Uh, she could have um, uh, not, she, she could have been willing to say she wasn't innocent. That she could have, you know, turned on Julius. And one of the things that I'm trying to understand is, What do you think at the end of the day, the fact that this woman didn't do what would conceivably, not certainly, but conceivably kept her alive for her kids? How was she reconciling those divided loyalties to a principal, to her husband, to the, you know, a miscarriage of justice. I just, I had a hard time finding a place where I had any shred of understanding of that. Well, first of all, I actually don't think she had a real choice. I think she was completely trapped. And I think she was trapped because she recognized that she could not live as a mother to her sons if the price for doing that was to say, look, I know that Julius was a spy. First of all, she would have had to have named names. And the spies that Julius enrolled were their friends. And, and that was, of course, a mistake. You weren't meant to enroll your friends. So there was no way that they were going to put their friends through what they had been through. I think Julius was convinced that there was no evidence against him. Therefore, by sticking together, they would both be free. But when they when they got too far, I think Ethel felt she could not be a mother to her sons if when they grew up, they said, but you had your freedom by, by causing the death of our father. She could not have lived with that. And, and I think that that was part of it. But secondly, and, and this is how I've come to see the story, Ethel believed, uh, first of all, it's a love story. She adored her husband yeah. and she admired him and felt that he was doing the right thing. And she felt that he had rescued her from the Greenglass family. So what she believed in, in this, you know, isolated prison cell where she didn't have access to good advice was that the best legacy she could leave them was loyalty to show them that she had been loyal not only to her husband, but to their friends and to their ideals. And that that's what it meant to be a Rosenberg, whereas the green glasses stood for betrayal. I mean, I do believe Ethel was betrayed by the media, 
she was betrayed by the judiciary, she was betrayed by her own family, but most of all her own family. And she felt that the best legacy she could give her sons, and arguably that's proved correct if, if you look at them and the life that they've had, was to show them loyalty trumps betrayal. You know, Anne, as I'm listening to you, I am struck by exactly that last uh, point uh, that you made. And you do have a little bit uh, at the end of the book. I mean, we've left out lots of fascinating parts of, of the story, which is complex and dramatic. And, and I hope uh, people who do listen to this podcast will go back to the book and listen to and read about all the intricacies. But you know, I don't think I quite got to the conclusion you did till this moment. And that is that in this ironic way, because of the goodness of the Mirapoles, a, a, a unrelated family that took them in and the apparent well-being of both Michael and Robbie as men today, um, does seem imbued with respect for particularly their mother's loyalty and what they saw as her integrity to her husband and to her principles. So, you know, in this perverse way, if Ethel hadn't been um, executed and did get out of jail, it might have, and the cost she would have paid for that, would have had a bigger price for her kids. I mean, I see it a little differently now that you um, talk about it in that way. That's, I mean, we'll never know, right? Those are the big what ifs. One will never know. And I've had this conversation with many people, including my own daughter, who's a mother, who says, I can't believe why any mother wouldn't do anything to be with her children. And, and it's a hard one to swallow. I, I guess the other fact in the mix is that I don't believe Ethel was a natural mother. I think she was trying to be the best mother she could and a better mother than her own mother had been to her. So there may have been an element of self-doubt, but I don't think that's what was motivating her. Mm -hmm. I think she really felt that loyalty was the best legacy she could give them. So um, in, in closing, Anne, because we've, we've covered a lot, um, you talk about uh, that you believe Bethel's story is as important today as ever because of what can happen when fear, um, which you describe as a forceful and blunt weapon in the hands of authority turns to hysteria, absolutely informs this trial and the story. What do you hope a reader will take away after reading your story of Ethel Rosenberg? Well, I hope they'll see Ethel as a fully rounded three or four dimensional woman who has some humanity. As I said, just look at the photographs. The, the public was led to believe that she was a wicked, evil woman. But life is more complicated than that. If, if I had to say what really I hope people will take away from this from this book, one, one thing, it's the importance of, of the rule of law. Mm. Yeah. Well, Anne, uh, I admire the work that you've done to resurrect the story of Ethel Rosenberg in a in a more full-bodied way as you've done for Jenny Churchill and, and Wallace Simpson. I just think you are, you are taking these women and drawing them as multi-dimensional creatures, which we as women are, is what feminism is about. And I think that um, this book, in, along with your other books, is... Um, a worthy reminder uh, to us how easy it is to flatten the view of someone and uh, give in to a stereotype. So 
Thank you for changing uh, that narrative. Well, thank you so much for letting me talk about it. I'm, I'm really, I feel so privileged to, to discuss it with you. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Great. Thanks. So Anne's in Greece. So Anne, get some rest. Okay. Good night. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye.